This is the Weekly Set, an official podcast of thetotalscreen.com. everybody and welcome to the weekly set the official podcast of the total screen i'm your host my name is tyson and joining me today as always is my partner in crime here at the total screen william rorick hello so today will be our penultimate episode of our podcast episode 299 of the podcast this week we will be discussing the final two episodes of falcon and the winter soldier uh we're just going to be closing out that chapter and next week we're going to be doing something more related to kind of the history of this podcast and we're going to be reminiscing and talking about some stuff related to that to finish up the podcast but don't worry we will be coming back with a new podcast in a month or so something like that we're, we're still kind of ironing out the format but it's going to be a broader approach podcast that covers you know video games and movies and tv and stuff like that and in a kind of a little bit more of a structured format so um you'll see that when it happens it'll be on the same general rss feed and pop up on the same youtube channel so if you're following the youtube channel or if you're collecting our podcasts through any podcast client or something like that it'll nothing's going to really change for you it's just the name of the podcast will be different and the format and stuff but on with today's podcast we are talking about Episode 5 of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Truth, and Episode 6 of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, One World, One People. We're not going to kind of break it down completely. We're just going to kind of talk more general about the series as a whole and how this series ended and some kind of interesting points we kind of want to make along the way. So first things first, now that you've finished the series, what are your kind of broad thoughts? My broad thoughts was I really enjoyed it. I thought they did, they did a really good job of kind of, kind of mapping out Sam Wilson's journey, uh, going from being the Falcon to being Captain America. Like, like I, I felt like they did a good job of communicating the complications behind, like, like the history behind the symbolism of Captain America, like the history of the United States as it relates to, uh, how the United States has dealt with race and the United States has not been good. <laughs> not at all. And I, I loved how they point that out. I loved how one of my favorite things about it is how they brought in Isaiah Bradley to kind of underscore the history, the country's history, not, and not just the history of Captain America, which Isaiah Bradley is a part of. And I'm glad that the super happy the MCU acknowledged that. And it was really, it was really cool that they did that and the journey Sam takes in kind of reconciling this. Cause it's, it is a thing where like Sam is putting on the stars and stripes mm-hmm. as a black man. And, yeah. and so, so he can't, he's repping for a country that has historically not given a shit about his people. And so it's a question of like, well, why should Sam give a shit? Why should Sam be Captain America? And I thought they did a good job of kind of mapping that out and kind of showing like Sam's journey and like his mindset and how he comes to reconcile these things in taking up the mantle. I mean, you saw it at the beginning where like he, he was hesitant to do it. He, he didn't want to do it at first. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's for those reasons, you know, it wasn't simply because he didn't feel like he could live up to Steve Rogers example. There's that baggage there. Mm -hmm. And I saw some comments online, you know, like some people uh, online have commented that, you know, like they didn't feel like Sam uh, taking on that symbol was justified, like that they didn't do a good enough job justifying that decision. But I mean, I just I, I felt like I felt like they did a real good job with it in showing Sam's mindset. One of the best things I loved about the entire thing was as far as the character goes, like there wasn't like any mustache twirling villain mm-hmm. in the thing. It was there all, were lots of complicated people. It, yes, it was all complicated people with different motivations, different goals, different agendas, 
and they were legit like the flag smashers you know they were the obvious like big antagonists but also like the reasons carly was doing what she was doing is like you can understand that you can understand her reasoning for her goals and what she wants what she what she wants is perfectly reasonable and what she wanted shouldn't be something that she had to, you know, to kill people to achieve. It should, what she wanted was for things to be fair for her and the other refugees in the world. If and, there was like a actual typical villain in the series, the closest would be like Batrock. Yeah, it would be Batrock. Because, and even then like Batrock, he, he's just a mercenary for hire. Yeah. I mean, I guess like, uh, you can, you can count Sharon Carter in that Sharon Carter is probably like the mustache twirly villain of this because <laughs> that's something that neither of us there were plenty of signs that it was heading in that direction but neither of us believed it and when it happened i just i i didn't really like it but then i started thinking about you know hey they're doing a secret invasion series maybe this is secret invasions related uh yeah maybe it's secret i i'm not going to go so far as maybe she's actually a scroll because i think that'd be like a really lame cop out uh I, but i just i don't like the turn for the character i don't think it's a yeah. i don't think it's a turn that makes sense we, we but talked about i think this if before. they're if they're gonna go with the turn turn i think they should commit like don't cop out of it by saying it's not really her please that would be really lame you you did this you went this direction please commit to it like i don't have to agree that they went that direction with the character but now that they did i want them to commit to it see i disagree just because i think it's a bad turn i don't think it's a good turn and so i don't think they should commit to i think they could do some turn. i think they could do some interesting things with that I think they could, you know, so we'll see where it goes. Other than Sam's journey, uh, I also like Bucky's journey. Obviously, Bucky still suffering trauma from uh, from being the Winter Soldier. He had a more like emotionally weighted journey. Yes. Uh, Sam's journey was, I mean, it was emotional for Sam too, but Sam's journey was more of like, a, it was more about like, I guess, anxiety about like taking up a mantle that he's not sure he should or right. that he even wants to and, and, and kind of the, the weight of that mantle and what that means. Whereas like, Bucky's is more like purely emotional on the on the front of like well it's personal for you Bucky. know yeah Bucky's it's, it's journey coming was coming to grips with what he what he did yeah it was coming to grips with with what he did you know and what what happened to him because let's 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 face it like should you blame Bucky for what the Winter Soldier did uh, Bucky Bucky is a victim yeah. of other people controlling and manipulating him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, to him, he's get he feels the weight of it as if he had done it, you know? Right. So he doesn't, it's not a matter of like, um, should we blame Bucky? It's more like, does Bucky blame Bucky? And I think in that sense, like, that was the weight that was on, you know, um, Bucky's shoulders. Everybody had weight on him in, yeah, this, had, in this series. Yeah. Everybody, yeah, everybody was carrying a big burden er, of weight. Yeah, everybody him. was carrying weight. Uh, Carly was carrying the weight of, just trying to just trying to get equity and fairness for herself and the other refugees like her the weight of a uh, cause the weight of a cause yeah sam wilson was dealing with the weight of history yeah you know uh the weight of a mantle the weight of a mantle bucky was dealing with the weight of his personal trauma and john walker was dealing also dealing with the weight of a mantle but in a different manner mm -hmm. where where john walker was like just trying to be Steve Rogers and failing. I think in many ways, his weight was the weight of the truth. <laughs> yeah. Because I think an uh, interesting point they were making was that, you know, in World War II, when we were at war, when, when the lines were more clear cut, Nazis bad, you know, when it right. was more like that, like warfare and, and kind of the, the acts of warfare and what people would do, it just felt more justified, more like, more like black and white, you know, but like modern warfare is really different from that, you know, and the weight of what he did even before he took on the mantle of Captain America was a big weight for him, you know, like he, like he made a comment at one point about, uh, looking at his medals as a reminder of the worst day of his life and taking on the mantle 
I think it was less that the mantle had weight for him. Like the weight of, there was no weight of the Captain America mantle for him. It was more that it was like trying to, it was his solution to taking another weight off of his shoulders. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's true. So it's like the weight of the, the truth of what, you know, what it means to be a hero in quotation marks, you know, like what that actually means. That was his weight. Right. He thought, he thought like, uh, because, because of what he did in Afghanistan, he thought taking on the mantle of Captain America, he could redeem himself. Yeah, he could do that. something genuinely good. He could be part of something that was genuinely black and white, good versus evil. He could be a symbol of hope in that thing, and and, he, and that's not what he ended up uh, being no. a part of, you know? Yeah, that's not what he ended up being a part of. There's also the fact that he's trying to do good, but he doesn't, he doesn't always know what the right thing to do is. He was trained for results, not for, yeah. not for making the right choices. We've talked before about how Steve Rogers wasn't even necessarily a good soldier. You know, if you yes. think of a soldier as somebody who takes orders and follows them, then John Walker is a good soldier, you know, but, uh, Steve Rogers wasn't, you know, Steve right. Rogers was barely like in the military, you know, before he took on his man and took on his task and he did it by you know breaking ranks doing what he wasn't supposed to do they made a reference to that in in this series as well with isaiah bradley having he basically did the same thing steve rogers did except steve rogers became celebrated and became the hero of america became captain america and isaiah bradley was put in prison yes because he did the same thing he went to save his men you know and that's what exactly what steve rogers did that was his first like real military action that steve rogers took if you if you remember it in in like the movie he they had the experiment the experiment Experiment, you know, like the, the, his creator died, all that stuff happened. And then they were like, well, we're not actually going to send you to war or anything, even though that's the whole reason you did this. Cause now you're like basically a scientific study rather than that. And then somebody gave him like, oh, well, we can actually use you to raise bail bonds and stuff. And that's what he was doing when he found out that Bucky and, and so many other soldiers had been taken hostage. Yeah. And he broke ranks and stuff. So he hadn't actually so- served any military mission before taking the mantle that's true that's true and that's a key difference because john walker was already a decorated military veteran by the time they chose him to be and captain as America. was isaiah bradley you know they, they yeah. were both they both came in as soldiers and then isaiah bradley disobeyed orders in order to save his men and went to jail for it whereas steve rogers well became isaiah bradley went to jail because he was black let's just yeah 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 so. well that that's the difference between yeah, the two that's of them. the that's why that's why one got one treatment and the other got the other you know yeah. but but there was an interesting parallel that they basically did the same thing you know yeah exactly and so for for that reason i found the series to be interesting to be like to be very interesting you know because there's a there there was a lot of there was a lot of gray areas with their with their characters and i honestly thought i thought they were going to resolve before this this show before the very first episode of the show came out i thought like okay well they're gonna they're gonna resolve sam becoming captain america like i knew that that was going to be a big part of this series. oh yeah obviously but i i thought <laughs> that it was going to be more of like a buddy cop one-off adventure that that he and bucky were having that eventually led to him taking the mantle like i didn't think it was going to be like a real emotionally weighted thing i thought it was going to be more like there oh, were right, yeah. in the way of him taking on the mantle and they were going to clear them together and then he was going to take it that was yeah, my that, perception of what the show was right, going to be right yeah i think i had that perception too that was going to be more comedic going to be more light lighthearted. It, it was it was a lot deeper it's going to be lethal weapon you know? yeah it was going to be lethal weapon it was actually a lot deeper and more emotional than and i blamed that on the pre- I, the, I think the previews kind of like did the previews thing and like sold a different show like i remember one of the big teasers before it came out was they showed the scene where like sam and bucky were like arguing over like they had that line where like bucky's like oh the one big three and then and then sam's like what big three and he's like 
aliens, monsters, and like with and sorcerers. Yeah, and and then like they go off. Oh, like, there's about, aliens, oh, side like aliens, robots, aliens, and, and oh yeah, sorcerers. yeah, aliens, robots, and sorcerers, or aliens, robots, Robot. and wizards. Oh yeah, wizards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> aliens, <laughs> robots, and wizards. Like they had that. Like that. That was a pretty funny scene. That was a pretty funny interaction with yeah. between Bucky and Sam. But that wasn't representative of the show. Yeah, yeah. like they didn't have too many uh, interactions like that actually. If I would just say something negative about the show, because I know some people kind of had some issues with it. Like you said, some felt that it wasn't, that the conclusions they came to weren't that earned, you know? And right. one thing that I, I will lend credence to that I is think that, that I think those are they could have gone a lot deeper. They could yes. have gone a lot deeper into the struggle of these people. I don't think that makes sense for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't think the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a place for really depressing, dark, long dramas, <laughs> you know, that right. deal with the human condition. Edition, you know, I don't think that makes sense within the tone of the Marvel. I, th- I, th- I think ultimately the tone of the MCU is a more hopeful tone. Like it, it's a more hopeful universe. Yeah, than the exactly. one we currently live in. You yes. know, it's the goal is uh is to be aspirational. Yes. So that's why. So the complaints about the kind of story they're trying to tell and the fact that they weren't able to tell it as well as they could have are kind of mitigated by the nature of the MCU and what they could have gotten away with doing and making it still fit tonally within the framework of the MCU. So they had what's both a strength and a limitation in that they were tied to the MCU. Right. So this isn't going to be the Hurt Locker, you know? (laughs) This isn't going to be Apocalypse Now dealing with like trauma in a really slow subversive way like you, you, you can't really do that you know they can touch on those themes though and they can leave the rest up to you as the audience to go okay I'm understanding the kind of emotion he's going through and I can add the weight of my own understanding to that scenario to get the satisfying weight that is needed and I think that's what they did like you're not supposed to take only what was in the story to understand that you're supposed to take like living in this world and knowing like what the situation is like with black America. You need to understand that and use the weight of that that you know in, in from our real world and apply that to the story to understand like so they don't have to fill in every little <laughs> they don't need to fill in every little piece of the plot for you to understand. You know what I mean? Right. And I think that's where it did well. I think the people that didn't like it, they wanted they wanted something more complete. They wanted something that kind of completed that whole picture for them. And I think that the M's the tone of the MCU wouldn't allow that. So instead, they left some openings where we where the audience could fill that in with their own knowledge of of what racism is, you know. They could like show, "Oh, okay, here's a here's an example of the kind of racism that's in the real world." And then you use that and your own knowledge of the real world and the kind of shit that happens in the real world to deepen those moments. Like Sam getting, you know, harassed by the police in Baltimore, you know, and him and Bucky were arguing Doing. Yes. It's like they don't need to spell out every detail of what's wrong with that or show like the actual like how bad things could go. They didn't have to actually have a police officer actually fire a shot or or do something that would have killed somebody except that, you know, it ended up coming to, you know, to Avengers. They didn't have to do that because we already know that. We already we already have that that knowledge base to understand that a police situation like that for a black man in America could end up becoming something exceedingly dangerous, more so than what we saw depicted. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. Like the, on, as far as the negativity for it, I also understand some people, they wanted that buddy cop thing that like, you know, that there were hints of, like you said, some of that's the fault of the previews. I think some of that was intentional though. Like they were, they wanted to lead us into that viewpoint and then they wanted to kind of tell a more compelling story. And because of that, people that really wanted to get in for the buddy cop drama didn't really get as much of that as they perhaps wanted. Wanted. But it's still there. You still had those funny moments and stuff. You still had the moment where they're working on Sam's family's boat and they say like, oh, who's going to lift that off the boat? And then you just see Bucky walk up and easily lift it off and says, you're welcome. <laughs> you still got those moments. Yeah. Oh, totally. 
Let's talk about the stuff that was set up in this movie or yeah. this show. Set up there's, for, there's the set ups for other things coming in the MCU. Oh, obviously, the big setup is Captain America Four. That was announced uh, right after. Yeah. 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 Well, it wasn't announced. Uh, it was the Hollywood Reporter reported through their sources that Captain America Four is in development. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so not not confirmed, but pretty. Yeah. Pretty. Uh, but we we knew this. Obviously, this whole thing was built to launch into Captain America 4 with, with Sam Wilson, Anthony Mackie as, as the new star of the franchise. This is why uh, I don't want a um, Falcon and Winter Soldier season two. It's not because I didn't like the show. It's because it's a transitional piece, you know? Right. It's a transitional, like, well, well, I was thinking about it and I was like, yeah, season two would be cool, but also like Anthony Mackie deserves his own movie. Like, let's give him his own movie first before we do a season two of this. Can well, we do I, that? I don't think you could tell the story that well in a two hour time frame. And right. so they needed a series to kind of tell the story. No, I mean I mean and let's give him his own movie. Yeah, yeah. No, but we go into a second season. I, I don't think we need a second season at all. I think this is like I think a lot of the MCU series that we're getting, they're transitional pieces. Like we don't need WandaVision season two either, you know? Like we maybe we'll have another series featuring some of the characters, but why would we have Falcon and Winter Soldier season two. There is Falcons that mantle's like kind of gone now. Like they even ended this season with like the same title card that went across that says Falcon and Winter Soldier, except it said Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Yeah, yeah. So like they they transition out of that, and I don't think we really even need a Captain America and the Winter Soldier series. Like we could see those characters pop up in another series or something, but I just I don't think that that's necessary. I think that this is a story that kind of needed a little space to develop uh, and yeah. now we now we get a captain america movie you know? yeah obviously yeah we had to have the transition and we get you can't do this transition in two hours and make yeah. it believe unless you were to say sam wilson just said hell yeah and took <laughs> a field like as soon as steve handed it to him yeah which, and so now yeah. they can do a real captain america 4 movie with sam like that's not an origin story you know that like right is him just jumping into the action you know Exactly. Uh, so the, yeah, the, that was the big obvious setup. But there's some smaller things that they set up again. Well, like, let's talk about one that, that started in episode five. So we haven't even mentioned this character yet. Yeah. No, we haven't mentioned it because I've been dying to get to this because this is probably one of my favorite setups. If, if they're, if they're doing what I think they're doing and they totally are, then I'm super excited about this. We but see yeah. a character with many names, Valentina Allegra de Fontaine. Yes. As portrayed by Julia Louise Dreyfus. Now, Malcolm Spellman, who is the showrunner of Falcon Winter Soldier and is also the one being reported to be writing the Captain America 4 movie, said he was like super excited about a, a, a big actor that was going to be popping up in episode five. Like that uh, okay. was the, that was the clue he gave. Kind of, it was kind of like a, like a Paul Bettany saying that, you know, there was an like actor in the finale that he couldn't, uh, couldn't wait to work with, you know, or like right. had been wanting to work with his whole life, but that ended up being a troll where it was himself, you know? This was like Malcolm Spellman talking about, so people were like, oh, who is this character going to be, you know? And the implication was that it was a, a character we haven't seen yet played by a major actor. And then we see Julia Louise Dreyfus walk up in a scene and approach John Walker and she talks to her and, and she gives her name and there's immediately a lot of things that can come into play here. This character in the comics was started out, I believe, as like a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Oh, she has like a very complicated, I, I read up on it. And she it's, like dated it's a, Nick Fury or it's something. It's a bunch of back and forth uh, complication where sometimes she's a hero, sometimes she's a villain. She kind of like Agatha Harkness, you know? Yeah. One of her most, one of her most, uh, one of the characters most famous turns is becoming Madame Hydra. Yeah. Which is like, some people think that's a me an immediate implication of what could be coming from this. Right. There, there are other things though, too, that could be coming from this. There's, that would be what Dark Avengers would be like more of a, the Hydra. But then there's also like Thunderbolts, which isn't Hydra related, right? Yeah. Thunderbolts isn't Hydra related. So. Well, technically, Dark Avengers isn't either. So Thunderbolts, basically the genesis of that is that was Baron Zemo's idea, that he was going to 
he was going to get one over on the Avengers by taking uh, his his team at the time, the Masters of Evil, and basically rebranding themselves as superheroes to kind of fool the world. That was Dark Avengers, right? I thought Thunderbolts was Thunderbolt Ross, right? No, Thunderbolts was Zemo originally. Okay. There's been all different iterations of Thunderbolts. It's American sense. comic books. It's- <laughs> It's like mythology. It's very loose. <laughs> but, but the original genesis of Thunderbolts was Baron Zemo hatching this idea to pretend to be superheroes. That was the original iteration. Dark Avengers actually spun up. And this is why I think it's the Dark Avengers, because Dark Avengers in the comics, that spins directly out of Secret Invasion, which, hmm. which yeah, Dark Avengers spins directly out of Secret Invasion. Because uh, the way the secret invasion ends in the Marvel comic books is that I guess Norman Osborn like ends up killing like the head scroll and then he gets like all the credit for saving Earth from the scrolls. Norman Osborn gets celebrated and as a result, they kind of they make him the head of shield. They just said like, oh, you're running shield now. And he kind of, I, I think he turns shield into sword. And then as far as one of his first acts as the director of sword, he announces a new team of Avengers, which is like him and like some super villain buddies that he knows. <laughs> and Aren't they like playing the parts of like existing superheroes? Like there's somebody yeah. else's Spider-Man and somebody else's Iron Man. And- yeah, 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 exactly. They, yeah, they take on the, the, they take on the roles of the existing Avengers. So like Norman Osborn himself takes on the roles of both Captain America and Iron Man. And that's where the Iron Patriot comes in because he just puts on like star spangled uh, Iron Man armor and calls himself the Iron Patriot. And he's like the leader of the team, obviously. And then you got like Venom taking on the role of Spider-Man. Bullseye taking on the role of Hawkeye. Dokken, Wolverine's son, taking on the role of Wolverine. Uh, <laughs> and, and stuff like that. I think at one point they have like the, the Red Hulk as for, for their Hulk. Yeah, so, so like that's the idea behind the Dark Avengers. And I know they can't do it like that. Mainly because, like, so far there has been no Norman Osborn in the MCU. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and that's going to be tricky because that's a Sony-owned character right now. And, and, There's a and, lending thing going on with Spider-Man, but it's not, like, all yeah. Sony stuff. That's Yeah, it's not, not all lending. Sony. Yeah, and that lending. So there's no Norman Osborn so far in the MCU. Also, they already did Iron Patriot way back in, like, Iron Man 3. They did Iron Patriot as like, as like the military rebranding like a war machine. Mm -hmm. Because like, uh, James Rhodes like says like they didn't think war machine was patriotic enough. Yeah. And I remember like he hated the name. (laughs) And he hated the name. Yeah. Yeah. That was like a running joke through the movie. (laughs) Yeah. That was a running joke through the movie. So they kind of already did that. So why I think actually, why I think is like they're doing Dark Avengers, but they're, they're doing it differently. I think it might even end up being like a blend of the Thunderbolts and the Dark Avengers. And I think the way they're going about it with this is they're obviously having Val. <laughs> she doesn't like being called Val. <laughs> they're having a, they're having Val like be a stand in for Nick Fury for this team. And so mm-hmm. she's obviously going around and she's recruiting these people who are obviously like dispossessed to join her team. When she talks to John Walker, John Walker had been fired from being Captain America. And he was like, he had been just, just been fired from being Captain America. He was sitting there having a pity party for himself, you know, feeling angry and dispossessed. And then that's when his wife. Yep. Him and his wife. And then that's the moment that she swoops in and gives him her card. Now she doesn't do it while he's still Captain America, you know, so that tells you what, what she's looking for. So what's interesting here is that because of the pandemic, Marvel's whole slate got like rearranged and delayed. Things got moved around. This was originally supposed to be the first thing from phase four of the MCU. This is like supposed to be the first project. It was not supposed to be WandaVision. It was supposed to be this. Then it was supposed to be, um, actually, no, wait, this wasn't. I think it was supposed supposed to be be Black Black Widow. Widow. And that character, Julia Louise Dreyfus character is reportedly in Black Widow. Yes. And so we got, we got kind of her appearances a little out of order. Yeah. Her appearances are a little out of order. So really 
Like, if everything released as planned, this scene would have had much bigger significance to the viewer. Like, if you watched it, it would have been in a movie, yeah. Yeah, because you would have seen her in Black Widow, and you would have seen what she did in Black Widow, and then you would have seen this, and then you would have, like, a clearer picture of, like, oh, so that's what she's up to, right? See, there's a tricky and, thing here, yeah. which is that what Marvel's doing with their TV shows is that they're saying these are in the same league as our movies. These are the same as our movies. The same universe are going to interact. You're going to have the same thing. And in this movie, we get the same actors who play, you know, Bucky, the same actor who plays Sam, the same actor who played, you know, R- Rhodey, even the same actor who played Batrock. You know, it, it's you, you have like all these people like follow through and it's like, OK, so this is a bigger thing. But there's still I think there's a little kernel of doubt because this has never happened before where you've really had TV crossover and movies in this in this kind of scale in this kind of way. And. And I think that if you had seen Julia Louise Dreyfus's character first in a movie and then seen her show up in a TV show and then seen some of the characters that showed up in this show showing up in movies, which is the plan, you know, like we already know that, for example, one of the characters that was introduced in in a, a WandaVision is going to be in the next Captain Marvel movie, you know? Yeah. So they're, they're going to show up in the movies too. There was like, an obvious setup in yeah. WandaVision for the next Captain Marvel movie. All of these it. were supposed to be happening kind of, they were supposed to be happening around the same time. So you would have Black Widow come out and then one of the ser- a couple of the series come out and then another movie come out and everything was kind of lined up in a certain way that you get that effect of it all kind of coming together. And that's been kind of disrupted because of the pandemic a bit. Yeah, that's been disrupted. But I mean, now that we have this, I can I can kind of guess what, you know, what Val is doing in Black Widow, too. Mm. And that's probably like she's she's probably going to hand a business card to Yelena. You know, that's probably what she's there for. If I had to like make a guess. (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like the post credit scene in you know and in, in the original Iron Man movie and then in the you know what movie. I I I bet her entire appearance in Black Widow is as a post credit scene probably. Recurring. In the same fashion as the Nick Fury scene, as a direct parallel to Nick Fury scene in the first Iron Man. That's yeah, and then we had the scene games. in the Hulk with Robert Downey Jr. showing up, yes. kind of, you know, making that connection to talk to Thunderbolt Ross, you know? Yeah, I think you're going to get these kind of connections like that that it was supposed to be a post credit scene and then it was going to introduce it in this series it's the impacts a little bit lessened by that but it's still really cool when you think about where they're taking it you know yeah, it's really cool and and the reasoning i i think like dark avengers is just because like again in the comics it's linked to secret invasion and this happening in close proximity to an announced secret invasion series kind of like it, it's kind of hard to ignore yeah I know you disagree, but I'm still I'm still really hoping that the Sharon Carter thing ties into Secret Invasion. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I ju- I just hope because because I I know Secret Invasion is about the Skrulls, so I know they have to have like some surprises with regards to that. Like some some people some characters do have to end up being Skrulls, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> for that to work. So I, I, yeah, I'm not sure, but, but I know like, uh, that seems to be coming sooner rather than later because they've been announcing casting for Secret Invasion. Yeah. So that sounds like that's already in production. Yeah. Or like in late stage pre-production. Yeah. Or in late stage pre-production. Uh, because we haven't even got casting announcements for like Moon Knight or really or She-Hulk or any of the, or some of the things they announced before Secret Invasion. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the other setups that we're getting. So we've that talked to, we, we talked it before about, you know, when IO showed up from Wakanda and the kind of the introduction of those people that those forces. So the interesting thing about Wakanda in the MCU right now is that we really have no idea what they're going to do with Black Panther 2. It's still scheduled on the books. It's still being worked on, but yeah. we really don't know how they're going to handle it. The only that's thing we a, know is that they're not recasting T'Challa. They're not, yeah, well, they're not recasting T'Challa and they're not going to do like some CGI of Chadwick Boseman or like mm-hmm. anything like that. Yeah, like, they're going to be respectful, which makes it like, okay, so what is Black Panther 2 going to be? But then there's something else on top of that because we also know that there's going to be a Disney Plus series about Wakanda. Yes. 
So that series might actually serve as the same the same thing as as the lead into next Black Panther and kind of kind of set it up and kind of explain where they're going with that franchise. I think Io is going to be a bigger player in the Wakanda TV series than she was in the Black Panther movie. Um, she was she was like kind of second in command under Michonne from The Walking Dead. Yes. In in Black Panther, and I think that that you know that character is going to be really central, a big part of the Black Panther too. And I think Io is being set up in this movie to be a, a larger, more recognizable face for when they do the Wakanda TV series. That would be my guess, but who knows how they're going to, you know, weave everything together here. Black Panther and the whole Wakanda situation is one of the like biggest unknowns right now in the MCU, you know? Right. Yeah. Because of real life tragedy. What other kind of big setups well, have we got? Well, obviously, they're doing something with Sharon Carter, right? Obviously, they got big plans for her. We yeah. just don't know what... If it's Secret Invasion or if it's something else, yeah. Or if it's something else. You know, they, they announced Armor Wars. Uh, maybe she plays a part in that. Maybe uh, maybe her... Because she's clearly, like, infiltrated the government now, and she's willing to sell off government secrets to highest bidder. Straight-up reference selling, like, government blueprints and shit for weapons. Yeah, for weapon so maybe so you know maybe she leaks out blueprints and stuff for iron man tech and that gets out and that causes the armor wars Mm -hmm. you know so maybe that's it they're also aren't they're doing an iron heart series too aren't they (laughs) they are which is another like you know iron man kind of spin-off type show that's going to end up probably linking into armor wars as well in some way uh yeah i think so that would make sense there's there's a lot of setup both in in um in WandaVision and in and uh Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yeah, you could see just watching these two series how big Marvel's plans are for for the future here for this phase. I think a lot of people are expecting John Walker to be showing up more like obviously if he's going to be part of, you know, Val's plans, then that's going to be a part of that, but he could go even beyond that cuz he's played a pretty versatile role within the comic books, you know. Yeah, he yeah, he has. Uh and I like the last episode he officially became US agent. And he's got the US agent costume on now. And I still say I really want it. Like, there's no signs that this is be a setup, but I really think there needs to be an Isaiah Bradley series. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I, I'd, I'd yeah. love to see, and I'd say it before, like, I'd love to see it something like, have you ever seen the movie or heard of the movie? I think it's called Badass. It's with, uh, um, well, Danny Trejo. Well, they got, they get, they, they got his grandson. Uh, yeah. In that, who... but, but I'm asking, have you, have you heard of the movie like Badass with Danny Trejo? Uh, I've heard of it. I don't think I've have, seen it. Have you heard of that a long time ago? There was this, or not a long time ago, but there was this real life case where this guy was attacked on a bus, this elderly man, and he stood up. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then they kind of made a movie based on it, and they had the guy was played by Danny Trejo in it and stuff. I could totally see them doing something akin to that with Isaiah Bradley, where it's not so much that he's standing up for himself, but that he gets involved in something related to his community. He tries to help somebody, and then you get his backstory, like the kind of shit that happened to him and the, I was the, gonna his, say, his part in the series that threw like flashbacks. I, th- I think it's more unlikely they'll do a prequel. I think it's more unlikely that they'll they'll do something with his grandson yeah that, well i mean that's like that seems like set up for uh is it young avengers where they have like they've been setting that uh, up for a while now yeah yeah i think i think i'll i think it might be young avengers that they do that yeah because they've been kind of like seeding that stuff yeah because they got like uh wanda's like kids uh which which you know they're gonna bring back i mean yeah the whole the whole it- Stinger at the end was Wanda using using that book to uh, try and bring her children back into existence. Plus, you have I, um, uh, Ant Man's daughter, yeah, um, who is tied into it, and yeah, you have other characters kind of being set up there, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. Like she was aged up, you know, with by because of the time skip um, in Endgame, so it, it like puts her at the right age now, you know? So. Yeah, they they could totally, and they've already shown that Wanda's kids can just be aged up at any moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, literally within a second, you know. 
but yeah, like, so that there's, there's a lot of kind of interesting kind of setup stuff, mostly for like, you know, secret invasion, cap four, that kind of stuff, like, you know, armor wars, things like that, that they're set up for. I think, you know, R- Rhodey's appearance in the first episode of the series is like probably going to be a link to his, you know, his role in, um, armor wars, you know, and where that ends up happening and, and some of the themes that they'll draw back upon from this, you know. But yeah, uh, I'm excited, man. Next series we got coming up is Loki. I think Loki's coming out before Black Widow now because Black Widow is delayed again. Black Widow is in July, so Loki is coming out before Black Loki's Widow. Loki's June, yeah. Yes, yeah, Loki's June and Black Widow's in July. So yeah, that's definitely coming out first. Loki's going to be cool. I'm not sure what the connections are going to be. I know that Loki is planned to be a multi-season show. This isn't going to be like a one and done like the previous two that we just saw. Mm-hmm. At least they're hinting at that. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't know like how like actually connected things are because, because just because of the concept of the show, the concept is like, this is a variation of Loki that we saw in Endgame, and this is kind of him going through the timeline and trying to, like, kind of fix things. Well, it's, so, it's, there's an implication that there's other variants of Loki. Oh, yeah. Within the series. Yeah. And that, you know, well, so, because, so in a sense, this is going to be one of our first because, real dives into multiverse stuff. That's true. Yeah, this is going to be one of our first real looks at the uh, Marvel multiverse. So this is gonna be, be exciting. Yeah, that'd be super exciting. I thought we might have to wait for Multiverse of Madness to actually get the real dive into it, but it looks like that's gonna start hitting up with Loki. Watching like they had like a new trailer like a month ago, I think, and like it's starting to give me like heavy like Umbrella Academy vibes. Yeah, <laughs> with like uh, with number fives like group in that in that show, you know. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. The Time Bureau. It, it's, yeah, it's very similar, isn't it? Yeah, it's getting the, the kind of the right kind of weird vibes of that, you know, that are kind of exciting. Plus, there's some there's some rumors about a, a big character that people think they saw in the trailer. You kind of see from behind and they think they know who it is. And that would be really interesting. <laughs> but yeah, MCU, man, still killing it. Yep, absolutely. So yeah, I think it's safe to say we both really enjoyed Falcon and Winter Soldier. Where would you put it up against WandaVision? I actually enjoyed Falcon and Winter Soldier more than WandaVision, I'm going to be honest. I think I enjoyed WandaVision more, but I think Falcon and Winter Soldier ended better. Well, definitely ended better. For me, WandaVision, WandaVision was nice. It was a good show, but then, like, it, it kind of fell apart. And, like, the, the ending I didn't like so much because just just because, like, Agatha turned out to be, like, a one-dimensional villain, I thought that was so disappointing. Like, Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think the problem with WandaVision is, is in its second, not even second half, like, last third, maybe. Yeah. That series is kind of where WandaVision suffers a bit. But... I think that WandaVision as a whole, when you take in the whole thing and, and you don't just acknowledge just what ended up happening, but like how it was presented from the beginning and stuff, I think I liked WandaVision. I, I, I loved more. it as a, I loved it as, as an exploration of Wanda's character, you know? Yeah, more, exactly. More so than, more so than the, like the plot bits. That I liked, I liked the TV gimmick. I liked the exploration of her character. I loved the emotional uh, aspect of the show. The weight of it, you know, like I thought was really, really well done in WandaVision. Like it really like got me. But I think, like you said, you know, it kind of fell apart in its like third act. Whereas like Falcon Winter Soldier, I think, I don't think it necessarily like nailed the landing, but it like, it did a much better job than WandaVision did. Yeah. So yeah, so it, it's it's kind of it, this is kind of reminding me of like debating what was better, Daredevil or Jessica Jones, <laughs> and that they both kind of had like different strengths and weaknesses, you know, to them. Right. But yeah, that's it for this week's discussion. And that, like I said, this is the penultimate episode of our podcast. So next week we are going to be talking about you know, our own podcast. We're going to be talking about things from the past of this podcast. We're going to have like little surprise things that we're going to cover. Um, we're going to have some fun with a few things. So tune in for that. It's going to be the last episode of this podcast. It's not going to be the last thing we do podcast related. It's just the last episode of this podcast. Um, yes. 
Until then, here's what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. On Wednesday, April 28th, The Handmaid's Tale returns to Hulu. On Thursday, April 29th, The Bad Seed comes to Sundance Now. Dead House Dark comes to Shudder. And Yasuke comes to Netflix. On Friday, April 30th, The Mosquito Coast comes to Apple TV+. Plus. On Sunday, May 2nd, DC's Legends of Tomorrow comes to The CW. The Girlfriend Experience returns on Stars. That's weird because, like, it was already a full series and now it's, like, coming back, but it's, like, a different different series or something but from the same oh, people it? oh that's weird it says it's it's, uh, it's weird I, I don't know i wasn't really into the first from, series so. from, from from the from the people at showtime who who thought like uh they should follow up dexter with oh no no this is stars no i know but from the people at showtime who thought you could follow up a uh, dexter with a with a spin-off of dexter starring dexter <laughs> <laughs> that's just dexter <laughs> yeah it's just dexter yeah this is this is this isn't Showtime though. This is Stars, which is another I know, channel I know. That's suffering. I was, I was making a joke. <laughs> I was, it, it wasn't literal. <laughs> it, was, not, it almost could be. It feels like the... something Showtime would do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, also on that day, Pose returns to FX. I believe it's for its final season on Tuesday, May fourth. Star Wars: The Bad Batch comes to Disney Plus. On Thursday, May 6th, Stuck With You comes to All Black. On Friday, May 7th, Mystic Quest or Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet returns on Apple TV Plus. Shrill, I, I think it, it's either debuting or returning on Hulu. Um, Dynasty on the CW and Jupiter's Legacy on Netflix. That's an interesting one. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that, but it, it could kind of go either way, you know? That's the uh, uh, Mark Millar series, like the first of, of the series based on his works since Netflix bought all of his works. Oh, okay. So that one will be interesting to see if it if it holds up to, because Netflix has done some good kind of superhero related stuff, you know? They did the Marvel Netflix shows, but then they also did Umbrella Academy, you know? So it could be really cool. Could be not. I don't know. We'll have to see what that ends up being. But until then, you can follow me on Twitter. I am at Tyson Gifford. You can follow Will. He is at Voxel Hero. You can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, as well as our site, thetillscreen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast through any major podcast client like Apple Podcast or Pocket Cast. And the entire backlog of our podcast is is available on our YouTube channel. Thank you everybody for listening. Good night. Good night. If you would like to reach out to us and make a comment, send an email to contact at thetotalscreen.com. Stay tuned to The Total Screen for the very best in genre television.